Preface of First Communion Days. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Therese. First Communion Days by Sister of Notre Dame. Author's Preface. Encouraged by the good wishes and kindly criticism of many who have read and used true stories for First Communicants, the writer ventures to place a second volume of stories, First Communion Days. Like the first, they are all true, so they should satisfy even the least of these little ones, that they may help to draw some of them closer to him who long for children to come to him, is the writer's earnest wish. First Sunday of Advent, 1919 Preface it is with pleasure we present this new set of stories from the good sister who selects for us such nice things from her storehouse of precious memories, of the sayings and doings of first communicants. With these sets of stories at hand, one can face with some confidence the difficult task of preparing our little children of six and seven for the sacraments. This is the use the author has made of them, and, finding their value, has generously given them to the world. We trust the store is not yet exhausted. W. Roach, S. J., Octave of the Immaculate Conception, 1919. End of preface. Section 1 of First Communion Days by Sister of Notre Dame. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Joseph. A sister of charity was one day visiting the family of a poor child, attending the school of which she had the charge. In her hand she carried a basket of provisions, for the family were poor and in want. Up one street and down another trudged the good sister. At last she came to a row of small shops, between two of which was a narrow passage, leading into a small square court. Around this court were sheds or rooms, and in each of these dwelt a different family. As Sister Louise came out from the particular room she had come to visit, a woman standing in the doorway of the next one spoke to her. Sister, she said, will you take my Joseph into your school? He's gone five, and the inspector's been round. As the sister stopped at the open door, she had a view of the entire room and family. It was poorer than any of you could imagine. Half the room was occupied by a large but broken-down bed, the rest by a table and two boxes used for seats. The walls were hidden by various garments hanging from nails. The one small window was broken and had a piece of paper stuck over the hole. This was Joseph's home, where he slept and played and had his meals. The family were at that moment having their tea, the father seated on a box, the three children upon the bed. Two cups without handles were provided for the father and mother, but the children shared a saucer between them. "'Come here, Joey, and let sister see you,' said the mother." Joey slid carefully off the bed, placed the empty saucer on the table, and stood beside his mother, looking up at Sister Louise. His legs were bare, his little shirt and trousers ragged, dirty, and torn. His face was surrounded by a thick crop of rough yellow hair, making him look like a copy of shock-headed Peter. "'He's a fine boy, is Joey,' said the mother, looking with pride on her eldest son, while she tried to rub up his face with the corner of her apron. "'He's that clever. There's nothing he can't do.' "'Has he been baptized?' asked Sister Louise. "'Oh, yes. Father John baptized him, along with Mrs. Moore's Tom.' "'Very well,' said Sister Louise. "'You may send him next Monday, but see that he is washed and tidy.' So the following week Joseph began his school life. His face had been washed in his little shirt, too. Otherwise he looked much the same as when Sister Louise had first made his acquaintance. Joseph thought school a wonderful place, something like heaven, he told his mother. It was warm, there was plenty of room to move about, pretty pictures hung on the wall, and, above all, there was music. Joseph loved music, and a lady actually played music while Joseph and the other children marched around the room. Dinner hour came all too quickly, and when afternoon school was over, he cried because he had to go home. His teachers became very pleased with him. He tried so hard at all his lessons that he was soon the first in his class. If only he were clean and tidy, the teacher would say to Sister Louise, we could do almost anything with him. Each morning, as soon as he came into school, Joseph was sent to wash his face and hands, but he could not wash his clothes, which every day became more ragged and dirty. Two or three times his sister had given him a coat or a jersey, 
but the next day he would come back without it, saying that his father had sold it, as he wanted money to pay for something to drink. It was the month of November. The children had been told about the poor souls in purgatory, and taught to say some prayers for them. In the school hall, too, there was a box on the altar, into which the children sometimes dropped a penny, for they were saving up to have a mass said for the holy souls. Joseph had never had a penny to spend, but he had often watched the others drop one in, and wished that he could do so too. About this time, Joseph became the happy possessor of his first penny. It came about in this way. His hair had become by this time so rough and untidy that Sister Louise asked his mother to let her get it cut. Permission being readily given, Joseph, accompanied by a big girl, set off toward the barber's shop. It was a bitter cold day. A sharp east wind was blowing, and the people in the streets drew their furs closely around them. Joseph had no furs. He had not even a coat. But though he shivered with the cold, it never occurred to him to complain. The barber looked with pity at the boy's scanty clothing and at his pinched and hungry-looking little face. And when the big girl gave him the usual threepence charge, he took one of the pennies and placed it in the boy's hand, saying, Here, laddie, go and buy yourself a bun or some sweeties. Joseph thanked him, and then with his penny safe in his hand, he trotted happily back to school. The door was just about to be locked, but Joseph slipped in and ran in great haste towards the altar. There, with a sigh of satisfaction, he dropped his penny into the box. Turning round, he saw the sister near him. The barber gave me the penny for sweeties, he said, and I buyed a holy soul out of purgatory instead. Two years went by. Joseph could read and write. He was, as his mother had said, a clever boy, but so ragged and dirty that he always looked the most uncared for in the whole school. But that did not worry Joseph. He loved his school, enjoyed all his lessons, especially his catechism, which taught him to love our blessed Lord. About this time, Joseph made his first confession, and then began to prepare for his first Holy Communion. The church was not far from the school, and every day Joseph would slip in on his way home and sometimes remain for a long time, praying before the Blessed Sacrament. To do this he had each day to resist the temptation to play cards with the other boys on a neighboring doorstep. This was a favorite game at that time. The boys would play for sweets or nuts or even for money, and Joseph had often been the winner of these coveted prizes. But Sister did not like the game. She told them it was a dangerous one for little boys and often led to sin later on. So Joseph had decided that in preparing for his first Holy Communion, he would give up playing and pay a visit to our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament instead. Although Joseph's father and mother never went to Mass themselves, they had not quite lost their faith and were quite willing that their children should go. Every Sunday, Joseph would get up, help to dress his younger brother and sister, and take them to the children's Mass. There he would kneel so still and join so reverently in the prayers and hymns that our Lord must have loved him very much. When the day of his first Holy Communion arrived, Sister told him that although it was into his soul that Jesus was coming, still out of respect for him, his God, he should make himself as clean and tidy as was in his power. This he did, and Sister lent him a large jersey and some shoes and socks, which made him look quite respectable. Jesus will hardly know me, he said, looking at himself with great satisfaction. After this, Joseph went to Holy Communion every day. He would take a crust of bread in his pocket for breakfast and eat it on his way to school from the church. One day the school doctor came to examine the children. When Joseph came in and the doctor noticed his thin, stunted little body and his ragged garments, he turned to the sister, saying, What a wretched, miserable little object! Joseph heard and his face flushed. When the doctor had gone, he said, Sister, our Lord didn't call me a wretched, miserable little object. When I went to Holy Communion this morning, did he? No, indeed, replied Sister. When Jesus saw you coming into church this morning, he said, Here is my little Joseph. How I love to come into his faithful little heart. Joseph's face flushed with pleasure at these words. Looking up into Sister's face, he said, I will always be his faithful little Joseph. And Sister felt sure that he would. End of section one. Section two of First Communion Days by Sister of Notre Dame. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Anne Catherine. On the 8th of September, 1774, our Blessed Lady's birthday, a little baby girl was born, who that same day was baptized and received the name of Anne Catherine. The house where she was born was poorer than any you have seen in this country. Built of wood and mud, it contained only one square room, which was divided by partitions. A few old chairs, a table, a spinning wheel, and some piles of straw and hay, which served for beds, formed the only furniture. There was no chimney. The smoke from the fire filled the room, where the family and their animals lived together. Anne Catherine's father had to work hard for his living. He was both good and pious. Everything around him reminded him of Almighty God. When Anne Catherine was hardly a year old, he would seat her on his knee, when he came home from work at night, and taking her tiny hand in his, would teach her how to make the sign of the cross, and to say the Our Father. When she could walk, he used to take her out with him in the early morning, and then when the sun rose, made her kneel down with him, while he, taking off his cap, would thank God for the gift of his beautiful son. He would tell her not to lie lazily in bed after the sun had risen, instead of making use of its light as God intended, and Anne Catherine was never known to remain in bed after she first awoke in the morning. Sometimes when they were thus in the field together, he would lay his hand on her head and say, Stop a minute, my child, and look at God's beautiful earth, all is so fair and wonderful. Or he would point to the little church in the distance and say, let us kneel down a minute and worship our God, hidden in the little tabernacle in the church. He can see us all the time, and give his blessing to our work. If the mass bell rang, he would make his little girl join in heart with those who were present, and sometimes teach her to say some of the mass prayers aloud with him. In this way he taught Anne Catherine to offer up all she was doing to Almighty God, and often to thank and praise him for his goodness. All through her life everything in God's beautiful world, the sun, the flowers, the trees, and rivers, reminded her of him and helped her to love him more. Her mother was pious as her father. She it was who first taught Anne Catherine the catechism in many of her prayers. When sending her to play with the other children, she used to say, If you children are good and play nicely together, the child Jesus and his holy angels will come and join in your games. Anne Catherine would then run out to play, thinking, as she went, of some game which little Jesus would like. Sometimes with the clay soil, she and the other children would make little statues or shrines. Anne Catherine was very clever at this. Another favorite game was to gather wild flowers, and then with these in their hands, to form processions in honor of Our Lady or the saints, asking their guardian angels to be their partners, while they sang hymns or said the rosary aloud. There was not, however, much time for play. From her earliest years, Anne Catherine had to work very hard. Indeed, it was wonderful how much those tiny hands managed to do, helping her mother in the house or her father in the fields. But all the time, Anne Catherine was thinking of Almighty God. She seemed to feel him near her, giving her the strength to do these duties. God was so pleased with this that he filled her mind with pictures of himself, when he lived on earth, or of his saints who had lived long ago, or sometimes of the souls in purgatory. These last pictures made the little girl feel very sad, and she would pray that the holy souls might soon be free from pain and go to heaven. Also, she would think out all sorts of penances to offer up for their release. When Anne Catherine was about four years of age, someone gave her a picture of Our Lady with the infant Jesus in her arms. This was a great treasure. She carefully hung it up in one corner of the room, placing a block of wood in front to serve as an altar. Here she would bring any little toy or present she had received, and leave it there for the child Jesus, and great was her joy if the present disappeared for she then thought that the child Jesus was pleased and had accepted it. Anne Catherine was a very lovable little girl. Even when quite tiny, she could not bear to see others suffering. If she met a beggar, she would tell him to wait, while she ran to ask her mother for some food or clothing, willingly going without herself, that others might be helped. In this holy way did Anne Catherine pass the first seven years of her life, until the time came for her first confession. For this she was prepared with the other village children of her own age. Anne Catherine felt sure that she was the naughtiest little girl among them, and spent a long time in examining her conscience, and in trying to make an act of perfect contrition. Yet the biggest sins she could remember were that once she had quarreled with another little girl, and once she had made fun of someone. She thought much penance and mortification would be needed before the punishment due to these would be cancelled. 
Her parents had given her a few pence to buy a little white cake for herself after her first confession, as was the custom in that country, but Anne Catherine gave hers to a beggar as a little mortification to atone for her sins. Time went by, and now the great day of her first communion approached, on which she was to receive the body and blood of her Lord for the first time. The burning love of her heart knew no bounds. She felt that she would never be able to do enough in preparation for so great an honor, yet she was anxious to do all she could, so that her soul might be found more worthy to become a dwelling place for Jesus Christ. She used to beg her parents with tears in her eyes to tell her of any sin that she might not have noticed, in order that not the slightest fault might remain unconfessed. When the day of her first Holy Communion arrived, Anne Catherine never once raised her eyes the whole way to church, so that nothing might distract her mind from Almighty God. Her one prayer was that He would always help her to do His holy will in all things. She offered her body to suffer and work for Him, her mind to think on Him alone, and her heart that it might always burn with a great love for Him, and that it might be always so pure that He would love to dwell within it. God answered her prayer, and Anne Catherine became more and more holy, doing great things for Almighty God, and receiving wonderful favors in return. End of section 2section three of first communion days by a sister of notre dame this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by maria therese cyril he was just four when he first came to school a sturdy little fellow with a face like an angel big blue eyes a halo of yellow curls and the sweetest smile dressed in a pale blue tunic he looked a perfect picture that first morning all the other children immediately fell in love with him each seeking the honor of sitting near him or showing him his way about. In the playground, chocolates and sweets were showered upon him until Sister thought it wise to warn them that too many good things would make him ill. Cyril took all this attention as a matter of course. In fact, he seemed to expect it, not showing the least shyness at so much attention. In school he was very good and interested in all the Sister said. He tried to do whatever work was set for the others, and yet the reason the mother had given for putting him to school, while he was still so young, was that at home he was never out of mischief. Cyril's home was a good half-hour's walk from the school. He had been told that he must never, never go out of the playground until his mother or nurse came to fetch him. He had twice already run away from nurse, his mother said, so after school they watched him very carefully till mother came. For some weeks everything went well. Cyril enjoyed school life and seemed none the worse for all the petting he received from the others, nor was he in a hurry to return home. But one day Mother was late. Nearly all the other little ones had gone. Only Cyril and three others remained in the playground with one of the mistresses. Once or twice Cyril had run to look if Mother or Nurse were coming, but not seeing them had once more joined in the game. Presently one little girl fell down, scraping her knee. Picking her up, the mistress wished to bathe it, so she told the others to play quietly till they were fetched or till she returned. No sooner had she left the playground than Cyril ran once more to the door to look for his mother. The street was deserted. No one was in sight. Why should he not go to meet her, he thought, and immediately he set out. Five minutes later his mother arrived, but by that time the other children had been called for and the playground was empty. Inquiries were made, but no one knew anything about Cyril. On returning to the playground and finding it empty, the mistress naturally thought the children had been called for, even taking the trouble to look down the street for any sign of them. In a great state, Cyril's mother set out to look for him, up one street and down another, then back home to see if somehow he had arrived there. Cyril's father went out and made inquiries at the police station. Nurse started once more towards school. Then, just as they were wondering what to do next, in walked the little culprit, quite unconcerned, fresh, rosy, and smiling. Hiding her great joy, the mother greeted him with a scolding. "'You naughty boy!' she exclaimed. "'How could you run away from school like that? I must give you a good spanking to make you remember to do what you were told.' When the spanking was over and the boy's sobs had ceased, the mother tried to make him understand how naughty and disobedient he had been. "'Have I not told you over and over again?' she said, "'that you may never go into the streets alone.' "'I didn't go alone,' he replied. "'My guardian angel walked beside me all the time.' "'Who?' 
said his mother, not understanding him. My guardy angel! Sister said he was always at my side. Yes, that is true, answered his mother, but I told you to wait for me or nurse, and it makes your guardian angel very sad when he sees you disobey. So Cyril promised that he would never again go home until someone came to fetch him. The next morning, when his mother told Sister all about it, Sister said, His guardian angel certainly took care of him in a wonderful way. Fancy a little fellow of four finding his way all that distance and crossing those busy streets, too. About a year after this, there was a school concert. Cyril was chosen to represent the little infant Jesus. Dressed in a white robe trimmed with gold, a golden halo fixed behind his curls, he made such a pretty picture that after the concert everybody wanted to talk to him. It was after this event that Cyril took such an interest in his catechism lessons. He was always wanting to know more about little Jesus when he was a boy. He felt somehow that as he had represented him in the concert, he ought to be more like him every day. He would sometimes say, Sister, what would little Jesus do if he were me now? Another time he said to one of the little girls, You can never be as much like little Jesus as I can, because you are only a girl, and I am a boy like him. He did not understand that it is by making our souls beautiful we become more like Jesus. The next year, when the first confession class was formed, he begged so hard to be allowed to join that Sister consented. Although Cyril was only six years old, he soon learnt the prayers and was able to answer all the questions, asked to see if the children really understood what they were going to do. When the day came, not only did Cyril make his first confession with the others, but afterwards with them was placed in the first communion class. Little Cyril was delighted. Little Jesus, whom he loved so dearly, was coming into his heart. Now indeed it would be easy to become like him for would not Jesus be able to tell him what to do? His eyes used to shine with delight when Sister was giving them instructions. How he longed for the day to come! But alas, Mother did not approve of Cyril making his first Holy Communion at all. Confession was all very well, but Holy Communion, that was a very different matter. She herself had been twelve years old, she said, able to understand what she was doing. Such a beautiful day it had been, full of joy and consolation, why, she loved to think about it even now. If Cyril made it while he was so young, he would forget all about his first communion day. Sister told her how it was the wish of the Holy Father that children should receive our Lord before they had soiled their souls with any big sin, and that by the strength received in Holy Communion, these little ones would be kept from ever committing many sins that other children fell into so often. She reminded Cyril's mother, too, how our Lord had rebuked St. Peter for trying to keep the little ones away from him. Just think how much others love your little Cyril, how much they like to have him with them and to talk to him, yet our Lord loves him with a much greater love than theirs, and longs to dwell within him. Why wait until that innocent little soul has been stained with sin before you allow Jesus to enter into it? But Cyril doesn't understand what he is doing, argued the mother. He understands quite well that it is Jesus he will receive under the appearance of bread, and that is all that is really required, though, of course, he knows a great deal more than that. Let me call him in, Sister added. I will put a few questions to him before you. You will be surprised how much he really knows, and how eager he is to receive this great sacrament. So Cyril was called into the room. Standing beside Sister, he answered question after question, clearly and without hesitation. When Sister told him that Mother thought him too young to make his first Holy Communion, he turned toward her, his eyes filled with tears. "'Oh, Mother,' he said, "'you won't keep me away from little Jesus, will you? I will be so good. Sister, do ask Mother to let me make it.' His mother was surprised at his eagerness, and went away promising to think it over again. But Cyril now gave her no peace. Each day he would ask, Mother, dear, you will let me make my first Holy Communion, won't you? Or, do let little Jesus come into my heart. Until at last Mother consented, and Cyril was made happy. He tried so hard to be good, and was so obedient, that even his mother noticed the change, and told Sister how pleased she was. She told her, too, how when she had taken Cyril to a party, he had refused to take any lemonade when it was passed around, that when afterwards she had asked him why, he had told her he wanted to offer it to little Jesus on his first communion day. It was so nice. 
but I expect he will be as naughty as ever once it is all over, she added. But Mother was mistaken. Cyril went to Holy Communion as often as Mother would let him after the first great day, and though of course he had his little faults, he never lost a desire to be just like little Jesus, and tried so hard to be good that he was loved by all, both at home and at school. Above all, he was loved by our dear Lord, whom he tried so faithfully to please and to imitate. End of section 3section four of first communion days by sister of notre dame this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by maria therese rose in one of our large towns in lancashire there once lived not many years ago a father and mother with five sturdy little boys the father had to work hard all day in a factory but he was a big strong man glad to be able by his labor to earn money for his large family who had to be fed and clothed and housed. The mother used to take in washing, so she was very busy, too. As I said before, there were five little boys, but there were no girls. Their father, who had always wished for a little girl, daily paid a short visit to the Church of the Sacred Heart, which he passed on his way home, to ask our Blessed Lady to obtain for him, from her divine son, a little daughter. After a time, Almighty God sent him the dearest little baby girl, whom they called Rose. The father and mother were delighted, and they did not forget to say a very fervent prayer of thanksgiving. As soon as Rose could run about and talk, she was sent to school with her brothers, who were all very fond and proud of their little sister. The five boys were all big and strong for their age, but Rose, on the contrary, was rather small, and so fair that often people thought her delicate, though really she had never known a day's illness. Rose was very happy at school and loved by both teachers and children. She got on well with all her lessons, but liked none so well as the first, which was all about Almighty God and how to love and please Him. By the time she was five and a half, she knew as much as the biggest children in the infant school, and a good deal more than most of them. Imagine her delight when one day Father X, the parish priest, coming into the infant school to settle with Sister, which children might begin to prepare for their first Holy Communion decided that Rose might be allowed to attend the instructions, although she was a year younger than most of the others. It was to be decided later whether she might really make her first Holy Communion. Rose herself had several times asked to be allowed to make it. Her father and mother were very proud that their little girl should be chosen so early, and they encouraged her to be very attentive. But Rose did not need much encouragement to be good. She was the most earnest in the whole class, and was able to explain many things to her brother two years older, who was to make his first Holy Communion the same day. When the priest came to examine the class, a week before the day chosen, which was February 2nd, no one answered his questions as well as Rose. February 2nd that year came on a Saturday, so the day before was the first Friday, and on the Thursday all the children of the parish were accustomed to go to confession in preparation for their first Friday Communion. There were always so many children to go to confession that day, that priests living near used to come to the Church of the Sacred Heart to hear them. There were not enough confessionals for all the priests, so some of them sat on the benches and the little ones would come and kneel at their feet to make their confession. Knowing how busy everyone would be, Father X arranged for the first communicants to go to confession on the Wednesday, three days before their first Holy Communion, when he would be able to give them plenty of time, for very little children do not like to be hurried. So on Wednesday afternoon, the forty-six little first communicants all made their confessions, and during their thanksgiving made up their minds to be very good for the next two days, so that they would not soil their pure white souls. Rose went with the others to confession. All the next day she was so quiet that their mother was afraid she was going to be ill, but the real reason was that Rose was not feeling quite happy. On Wednesday evening her big brother had been teasing her all day, at last Rose, getting impatient, had called him a horrid boy and given him a little slap, which made him laugh more. But Rose, running away upstairs to her bedroom, suddenly looked at the picture of the Sacred Heart over her bed, and remembered what she had done. All the next day she was sad at the thought of having, as she thought, spoiled the lovely white soul into which little Jesus was to come. Thursday went by. Friday morning came, when all the little children of the school who were able, went to Holy Communion. 
That morning Father X came into the school to make the final arrangements for the next day. Just as he was going out of the infant school, Rose ran up to Sister. Please, Sister, she said, may I speak to Father X? And what do you want with Father X? asked Sister kindly. I've done a sin, she answered, and I do want to go to confession again before tomorrow. Well, run along and tell him all about it, said Sister. He's in the next room now. When Rose came into the priest, she found him talking to the bigger girls. Running up to him, she slipped her hand into his. The priest looked down and smiled. What do you want? he asked. Are you not one of the little ones who are making their first Holy Communion tomorrow? Yes, Father, she replied. But please, I want to go to confession first. How is that? Were you not able to go last Wednesday? Yes, Father, but I've done a sin since then, and I do want my soul to be quite white when little Jesus comes in. Ah, oh, I quite understand, said Father X. Now you big girls get on with your work for a minute or two while I have a little talk with Rose. And taking her to the back row of desks, he let her sit on his knee while she whispered her trouble into his ear. Then blessing her and telling her not to worry any more, he sent her back to class perfectly happy. The next day Rose made her first little communion with her brother and all her other little companions. It was the custom in that parish for all the little first communicants to make a novena of communions. That is, for nine days after their first communion they received our blessed Lord each day. That meant for little Rose getting up at quarter past seven to be in time for the quarter to eight mass. She did not mind that at all. Her only fear was that, when the novena was over, she might not be allowed to continue. May I go to Holy Communion every day, sister? she asked, even when the novena is over? Certainly, dear, if mother will let you, sister replied. And mother was quite willing. So day after day and week after week, Rose received daily communion. When Good Friday came, she was quite distressed at the thought of having to miss a day, and asked sister if she thought the priest would let her receive Holy Communion if she asked him, and sister had to explain that no host are consecrated on the day on which our Lord died, and that only the dying may receive Holy Communion on Good Friday. Only one priest in each parish receives our Lord in a host consecrated on Holy Thursday. All the summer term and through the holidays, Rose never missed her Holy Communion, even for one day. When the following winter came, her mother thought she ought to have a long sleep now and again, but Rose begged so hard to be allowed to get up that her mother did not like to refuse her. One day her mother came to school and asked sister if she would persuade Rose to have a long sleep once a week. Is she not keeping well? said sister. Oh, yes, her mother replied. She never has a day's illness. Perhaps she complains of feeling tired? Oh, no, she goes to bed at half past six and sleeps soundly all night but she is often asleep in the morning, and it seems too bad to get her up in the dark every day. I don't think I should worry about that, replied sister. Holy Communion will do her more good than an extra half hour's sleep. So Rose was allowed to continue her daily communion. But one day Rose went out to a party, and it was nearly eleven when she went to bed. The next morning at a quarter past seven she was sound asleep, and her mother did not like to wake her. She slept on until the hands of the clock went it to half past eight, and then she awoke. Jumping out of bed, she asked the time, but when she found she was too late to go to Mass and Holy Communion, she cried so bitterly her mother did not know how to comfort her, until, remembering that there was another Mass at half past nine, she allowed her to go to that. At ten o'clock, Rose walked into school. Why, Rose, says Sister, what has happened? This is the very first time you've been late for school. Then Rose told her all about the long sleep and being too late for the quarter to eight mass. I knew you'd excuse me being late, sister, just this once, she said. Mother will wake me up next time. I came to tell you, but please may I go home and have my breakfast now? And it really was the only time. Month after month slipped by. Rose went up to the big girl's school. She worked hard at home, too, helping mother. But no matter how tired she might feel, Nothing could make her miss her daily communion. End of section 4
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Jackie. It was Holy Saturday, and in the large cathedral of X, the bishop was blessing the font, and the priest and people present were standing near. Presently the swing door opened, and in toddled three of the tiniest children ever seen alone in church. The eldest looked barely three years old, and the baby could only just walk with the help of the other two. Not the slightest notice did they take of the priest or people, but solemnly wended their way up the middle passage of the church until they almost reached the altar rails. Here they stopped, and all tried to genuflect, the two elder babies making a big sign of the cross before entering the bench, where they knelt for the space of a Hail Mary. Getting up, they walked a little farther on, and kneeling again with another large sign of the cross, entered the second bench, where they knelt for a very short prayer. Once more they went up still farther, and yet again the fourth journey bringing them to the front bench. Now they seemed satisfied. The genuflected for the last time, and, just as solemnly as they had entered, they toddled down the whole length of the nave, pushing open the swing door, and disappeared. The same morning, a lady who had been in the cathedral and had noticed them there met them just as they left the church. The two younger ones were seated in a carriage, and the eldest, standing beside it, was evidently waiting for somebody in the shop. The lady could not resist speaking to them. "'Are you not the three little children I saw in church?' she said. "'Do you often go there to say your prayers?' Three solemn pairs of eyes looked up at her, and the eldest replied, "'I take the little ones to see dear Jesus, so that he won't be lonely.' Mother says Jesus loves little children. And she looked with pride at her little brother and sister. And how old are you? asked the lady. Nearly four, she answered. Jackie's two and a half, and baby is one and a quarter. We live next door to Jesus. I am sure dear Jesus loves to see three such good little children, said the lady, and slipping a penny into each little hand, she went on her way, leaving the babies examining their coins. Two or three weeks later, the lady noticed the same three little ones coming out from Mass with their mother. As they came to the church door, they recognized her, and the little girl, pulling her mother's dress, said, That's the lady that gave us the pennies, Mama. The lady turned and smiled at the children, saying, Ah, here are the three little friends of dear Jesus. And she told the mother of their little visit, and what pleasure it had given her to see them so reverent in church. They love going to church, even baby, replied the mother. Who lives in there, baby? She asked the little one in her arms, pointing to the church door. Dear Jesus, answered baby, raising her little hand to blow him a kiss. Four years went by. All three children now attended school, for even baby was five years old. One Sunday morning, only the two little girls were at mass. Auntie and Jackie were very ill, and mother had to stop at home to look after them, they told the lady, who was now quite an old friend of the little trio. The next Sunday they were alone again. Auntie has gone to heaven, said Mary. Father Edwards brought Jesus out of church to our house, and Jesus took Auntie back to heaven with him. And Jackie wants to go too, said Annie. He keeps asking Mama to bring him the priest. But Mama says he is too young, said Mary. That day the lady went to see Jackie. The little child was lying in his bed, his face flushed with fever. Jackie was very pleased to see the lady, and one of the first things he asked her was to bring him a priest. Won't you ask Father Edwards to bring me Jesus, he said. I do want Jesus. The lady promised she would ask the priest to come, and Jackie was satisfied. That same evening Father Edwards went to the house. He had a long talk with Jackie, who told him how much he wished to go to Holy Communion. Finding that Jackie quite understood who would come to him in this Holy Sacrament, the priest told his mother that there was no reason why Jackie should not make his first Holy Communion, although he was only six years old, and in those days children had to wait until they were twelve or thirteen. How happy he was! Jackie made his first confession, and before the priest left the house, he promised to bring our Lord the next morning. Carefully, Jackie's mother prepared the little room. Everything in it was dusted and put tidy. A nice white cloth was placed on a small table, a crucifix in the center with a candle on either side forming the altar. There were some flowers prettily arranged, a glass of holy water, another little glass of water in which the priest could dip his fingers, and a small towel to dry them. 
Jackie watched these preparations with great pleasure. He was too ill to speak much, but once or twice he said to his mother, it will be nice to go to heaven with dear Jesus, won't it, mother? Yes, dear, she would reply, smiling at him through her tears. Though Jackie was awake and in much pain, a great part of the night, he never once complained, while the mother sat patiently by his bedside, doing all she could to give some relief to her dear little boy. Don't cry, mother, he said once. Jesus will soon come now. Early the next morning, Mary, who had been watching at the window, ran in to say that the priest was coming. Giving each of her little girls a lighted candle to carry, Mother went with them to the front door, where they knelt down as the priest, bearing Jesus, came in. They then led the way to the room where Jackie lay waiting in his little bed. He was too weak to move, but his eyes shone with joy. Jesus had really come. Jesus would take him to heaven, where there would be no more pain and suffering. Mother and the two little girls, and the lady who had also come to see Jackie make his first Holy Communion, knelt near the bed. Very reverently, Jackie received his dear Lord. After a while, the priest said aloud a few easy prayers that Jackie could follow, and then they all went downstairs, leaving him alone with his God, his eyes closed and his tiny hands clasped on his breast. A short time after, his mother came up, a cup in her hand, with something in it for Jackie to drink. He lay just as they had left him. Only his eyes were open, and a sweet smile was on his lips. But, as his mother came nearer, she saw that only her child's little body lay on the bed. Jesus had indeed taken Jackie to live with him in heaven. End of section 5section six of first communion days by a sister of notre dame this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by maria therese peter there were three of them peter john and joseph fair-haired rosy-cheeked brothers never still for a minute their blue eyes sparkling with fun and mischief peter the eldest was six and thought himself a very big boy in comparison with his two little brothers one of whom was only three and the other four years of age. Two hours each morning the little boys spent with their nursery governess, after which they were taken for a daily visit to their grandmother, who lived at the other end of the town, and who kept in her cupboard a large box of preserved fruits thickly coated over with sugar. At some time during the morning visit this box was taken out, and each of the little boys invited to choose one of these tempting fruits. The wonder they looked forward to their daily walk. In the afternoon the three boys played together in the garden, while nurse sat near mending socks. One afternoon, finding she was in need of more wool, nurse left her charges playing on the lawn while she went into the house to fetch some. She had only meant to be gone one moment, but she found so many things waiting to be put straight in the nursery that half an hour flew by unheeded. The three little boys had watched nurse disappear into the house, and instinctively, when left alone, they looked round for some piece of mischief. Peter caught sight of the apple trees at the end of the garden. They had been forbidden to touch the apples many a time, but Peter had forgotten this. "'Come along, John,' he cried. "'Let's get some apples.' The two younger boys scrambled to their feet and hastened after Peter. Alas, the tempting green fruit, which Nurse would say was not ripe yet, hung just beyond their reach. Peter tried lifting up Joseph, but still they could not reach. Then he espied a long stick leaning up against the arbor. "'Now we'll have them,' he shouted and with a few blows soon succeeded in knocking off half a dozen. Taking an apple in each hand, the three children returned to their seat on the lawn, and for a short time nothing was heard but the munching of sour apples. When Nurse returned, she praised them for being so good and quiet while she was upstairs, and said she was glad she could trust them. But that evening little Joseph became so ill that they had to send for the doctor. Mother made anxious inquiries about what he had been given to eat, both nurse and cook declared that the children had eaten nothing but the plainest food. They had not even had any sweets that day, added nurse. I wonder if he could have found any poisonous berries in the garden, said mother. At the sound of the words, poisonous berries, Peter, who was listening, trembled with fear. Were unripe apples poison? Supposing Joseph should die, it would be his fault. Oh, mamma, he cried, I didn't know they were poison. We all ate them, two each. Shall we die? What did you eat? asked Mother, looking very anxious. Poison berries off the apple tree, sobbed Peter. 
I knocked them off with a stick when nurse went indoors, and we had two each. Mother could not help smiling at the idea of the poisonous berries on the apple tree, though the sour green apples had certainly managed to make little Joseph very ill indeed. Sitting down on a chair, she took Peter on her knee and tried to show him how wrong it was to disobey, and how it was still worse to teach his little brothers to be naughty, too. How often had they been told not to touch the apples, and yet no sooner had nurse turned her back than they disobeyed. Mother tried to show him how, when nurse or mother were not there to look after them, Peter should take their place and be like a little guardian angel to them. Peter listened gravely to all she had to say, then throwing his arms around her neck, he said, I will be good, mother. I'll never teach them to be naughty again. And a little later, when saying his night prayers, he added, Dear Jesus, help me to be a guardian angel to John and Joseph, and please don't let Joseph die this time. Whenever it was possible, Mother used to put her three little boys to bed herself. First they used to have a little talk together, when Mother would tell them about our dear Lord and our blessed Lady. Then they would tell her what they had been doing during the day, and whether they had been good. Then, when they were just ready for bed, they would all three kneel down together and repeat after her their baby night prayers. Christmas came, and soon after Peter made his first confession. For some time Mother had been teaching him his prayers, and explaining to him all about this wonderful sacrament. "'I've done such a lot of sins. I specs I shall get a very big penance,' he said. But his mother told him how our Lord had suffered and done penance for our sins, but that we should try and do a little ourselves to unite with his. She told him, too, that the priest only gave a very small penance and confession, leaving the rest to our love. About this time Peter began to object to saying his prayers with his little brothers. I can't think when they are saying the words after me, he would say. May I go into your room to say them, mother? So when the time came for prayers, the two little ones still knelt at mother's knee, but Peter knelt in front of the little altar in mother's room, where he could talk to God properly, he said. Just before Lent, mother had been telling the three little boys about our dear Lord's sufferings. She had also tried to explain to Peter how during Lent it was the custom to give up something nice in order to be more like him, who gave up everything for love of us, and also in order to do penance for sin. "'What could I give up, mother?' he asked. The mother told him he must choose for himself. Peter thought and thought. At last he decided that a very good penance would be to give up the preserved fruit out of his grandma's box each day. The next evening he told his mother he had chosen this penance, and told her what it was. Mother kissed him and hoped they would not find it too hard. The next week Lent began. On Ash Wednesday Peter went to church with Mother, but the next day the boys went for their usual visit to Grandma's. That very morning a new box of preserved fruit was opened for the children. How delicious they looked! John and Joseph soon chose theirs, but to Grandma's surprise Peter walked quickly away to the window, saying, no, thank you, Grandma, not today, and he pretended to be very busy watching a robin in the garden. Why, are you not feeling well, my dear boy? asked Grandma, quite concerned. Oh, yes, thank you, Grandma, he replied, carefully keeping his eyes away from the tempting box. The next day came, and again Peter resisted the desire for his share of the fruit, but that evening he told his mother that he never thought it would be so hard to give it up. You are quite free to take the fruit as usual, if you wish, said his mother. Do you not think it would be better to choose something easier? But Peter would not hear of changing. No, mother, he replied. I want to do something hard. It will show Jesus that I really do love him. He did much more for me. The next day, mother told Grandma all about it. So after that, although each of the little ones had their usual fruit, she never pressed Peter to take one. As soon as he caught sight of the box, he would walk over to the window till it had disappeared again inside the cupboard, and each day he found it cost him less to give it up, till at the end of a fortnight he told his mother he didn't mind nearly so much now. Both mother and grandma were very pleased with Peter, and they felt sure that our Lord loved him very dearly for his self-sacrifice. When Easter Sunday came, his grandma, besides his usual present, gave him as much money to put in the box for the orphans as the fruit would have cost so that you can actually give it to our Lord, she said. Peter was delighted, and though he had many nice presents that day, he said that he liked that one best of all. Peter was now getting ready for his first Holy Communion. It was to take place on the Feast of Corpus Christi, and curiously enough, that year it fell on Peter's seventh birthday. 
Very carefully did he prepare for this great day. It was his first thought in the morning, and his last at night. Each morning when coming home from their walk, he would ask Nurse to go by the road that passed the church, so that he might just go in and pay a short visit to our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. When Mother asked him about having his little friends to tea for his birthday, he said, Please, Mother, may they come the next day? I just want only Jesus for my birthday. And his mother was very pleased with his suggestion. Corpus Christi came, and Mother and Father and Peter all knelt at the communion route together, Peter receiving his dear Jesus for the first time. He spent the day very quietly. Not even the arrival of numerous presents seemed to take his thoughts away from the happiness of the morning. And a few days later, when the first communion and the birthday party were both past events, Peter would say that on no day had he ever felt so happy as on Corpus Christi. End of section 6「Section seven of First Communion Days by a Sister of Notre Dame. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Betty. Betty was a dainty little maid, her fair hair curled prettily over her shoulders, her blue eyes sparkled with fun, and though her clothes were poor and often patched, still they were always clean and tidy, for Betty was very particular about her appearance. She would not go to school in a torn or dirty frock and many a night her mother, whose own clothes were anything but nice, would stay up late washing, ironing, or mending for Betty, as she had no money to buy her new ones. Betty's father, it is true, often earned good wages, and would leave his work with plenty of money in his pocket. But alas, very little of it arrived home, for before he got there he would have met some of his friends, and together they would go into a public house, and there sit for hours talking and drinking until all, or almost all, the money was spent. Betty's mother worked hard, too, but most of the money she earned had to pay the rent or buy food, so there was little enough left for new clothes. Betty was a Catholic, so were her father and mother, though no one would have thought it, for not one of the three ever went to Mass, nor entered a church to say a prayer. Her father spent Sunday morning in bed. Betty and her mother both got up very late, and then spent the rest of the morning in putting things straight and preparing the dinner. Betty took all this as a matter of course. Over and over again the sister in school had told the children about going to Mass on Sundays, but somehow Betty had thought it never mattered about her, until one day in June. That day the sister had been telling them of the love of the Sacred Heart, how great is his love for us, and how little he is loved in return. She told them, too, how the dear Sacred Heart was beating with pleasure at the thought of the visit of his little friends at the Holy Mass, how often so many disappointed him, Sunday after Sunday, and yet he still waited on. Would they still go on being such a disappointment to him? Was there one little child present here today who would sadden the dear Sacred Heart again next Sunday? Betty felt her cheeks growing red and hot, her eyes filled with tears, two or three dropping unnoticed on the desk. She seemed to see our Lord's sacred eyes looking right into her own. Ah, she had never thought of his love for her before. Every Sunday he had been waiting, waiting, and each time she had disappointed him. Never, never would she miss Mass again. The following Saturday night, Betty told her parents that she was going to Mass the next morning, and every Sunday in future. I shall never miss Mass again, she said. But I can't spare you, child, said her mother. There's so much work to be done on Sunday mornings. Don't think yourself better than your parents, said her father. We don't want any of that nonsense here. Betty did not answer, but in the morning she got up very quietly, so as not to disturb her father and mother, and set off to church for an early mass. She came home, her face beaming with happiness. She had not disappointed Jesus this time. Betty began to tidy up the room, for her mother was not yet down. When an hour later she appeared, the first thing she noticed was the child's happy face, but somehow this only made her cross. "'Be quick and wash those plates,' she said, "'and let's have no more of your nonsense. Your father was fine and angry when he heard you go out this morning. I wouldn't be you when he comes down.' But when father did come down, he seemed to have forgotten all about it, for not a word was said, and the next week passed by as usual. The next Saturday, however, showed that— Though he had said nothing, he had not forgotten. Soon after Betty had gone to bed, he came in, and the first thing he asked his wife 
was whether Betty had said anything about going to Mass. Yes, she replied. She told me she was going, though I promised her a beating if she did. No, he said. You'll not beat her. I know a better way than that. I'll hide her boots. She thinks so much of her looks and her clothes. She's a deal too proud to go to church in bare feet. That night when he went upstairs, he took Betty's boots from the side of her bed and locked them up in the cupboard, putting the key in his pocket. The next morning Betty got up very early. Father and mother were both asleep. Dressing herself quietly, she at last missed her boots and began looking everywhere for them. At this moment her mother opened her eyes and saw her standing there. "'You can get back into bed, Betty,' she said. "'Your father has locked up your boots, so you can't go.' But Betty did not get back to bed. She went downstairs and began hunting for something to wear. But in vain. One pair each was all that any of them possessed. What should she do? Surely our Lord would not want her to go to Mass without her boots. But this thought reminded her of the many, many times she had disappointed him. What a splendid way this would be to make up. Without another moment's hesitation, she took up her hat and ran out of the house in her bare feet. Up one street and down another she ran, and then suddenly stopped at the sight of two little school companions who stood at the corner of the street looking at her. Betty felt herself growing redder and redder. What should she do? They would be sure to tell the others in school, and what would they think? Many of the children there were very poor, but there was not one who had not a pair of boots, or who went to school on bare feet. It was too late to go back now. The two children had already gone on towards the church, and Betty followed them. Once or twice she saw them looking back at her. As soon as Mass was over, she slipped out as quickly as possible, and ran all the way home without once stopping. Her mother was too astonished even to scold her, and her father could hardly believe she had really been to church at all. She may have done it once, he said, but she'd not have the courage to do it again. You say she looked quite scared when she came in? The next day Betty's worst fears were realized. Quite a number of little girls were grouped together in the playground as she entered, and in the middle of them stood the two whom she had met the day before. When Betty entered, several turned and looked at her feet, and she heard one say, it couldn't have been Betty. She's wearing her boots now. But it was, replied the other, and she called out, Betty, didn't you go to Mass in bare feet yesterday? At that moment, Sister came into the playground, and Betty, who thought she had heard the question, ran up to her crying, I couldn't help it. I couldn't help it. It was quite a little time before Sister could make out what was the matter, but when at last the tale was finished, she told Betty how proud she was of her, and that she was sure our dear Lord was very pleased with her, too. She also promised the little girl that as she continued going to Sunday Mass, she should very soon make her first Holy Communion. Her sister did not think the boots would be locked up again, as that had not prevented the brave child from going to Mass. So Betty was comforted, and more determined than ever not to disappoint our Lord. But sister was mistaken in thinking the boots would not be taken away again. Sunday after Sunday, Betty's father locked them up, thinking each week she would at last give up going, for he knew Betty well enough to know what it must cost her to go out in her bare feet. But Betty was brave, and though each Sunday she felt that everyone was looking at her feet, yet she would not be conquered. At last it came to the very week when she was to make her first Holy Communion. There were only three little girls to make it with her, for the others had made theirs a few weeks before. The day arranged for was a Sunday. Betty would have no boots, what was she to do? She would appeal to her father's love, for she knew that in spite of everything he loved her dearly. That night when he came home from work, Betty went up to him, and putting her arms around his neck, kissed him two or three times. Her father put his arms around her and drew her onto his knee. Father, said Betty, next Sunday I am going to make my first Holy Communion. Please don't lock up my boots. You wouldn't like me to make my first Holy Communion in bare feet, would you? Her father did not at first reply. He had really been feeling very ashamed of himself for the last few weeks when he saw how very bravely his little daughter had overcome her pride in order to do her duty. Why do you want to go to Mass? he said at last. And then Betty told him of our Lord waiting there Sunday after Sunday and how she could not go on grieving him as she had once done. Oh, father, she said. If only you would come, too. Her father's heart was touched. Little one, 
he said with tears in his eyes, you have conquered. Next Saturday come to meet me at my work, and together we will go to church, and I promise to be a better father to you. Betty put her arms once more around his neck. How happy you have made me, father, she said. Her father kept his promise. On Saturday, as he came out from his work, there was Betty waiting for him, and together they went to church and to confession. And what is more, that very evening Mother was persuaded to go too. How happy was Betty the next morning! Sister had lent her a white frock and a veil, and Father had polished up her boots till they shone. There was no need to worry today about her clothes, and indeed she had no time. She had so much to tell the Sacred Heart, who had been lovingly watching and helping her through these trying weeks, and how well rewarded she felt for her little self-sacrifice when she saw her father and mother go up to the altar rails and receive their God, whom they promised to serve more faithfully in the future. End of section 7《Section 8 of First Communion Days by a Sister of Notre Dame. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Clement Cathery. Clement was a little French boy who was born more than a hundred years ago in the village of Moux near Montpelier. His father was a blacksmith, was an honest, hard working man, but unfortunately he no longer went to church and had even given up saying his prayers. His mother went to Mass on Sundays and to Holy Communion at Easter, but that was all. In fact, at that time there were very few people in the whole village who really loved our blessed Lord, which made it the more remarkable that Clement should grow up good and pious as he did. Clement was born on a Tuesday, 23rd December, 1828, the day of the week that is dedicated to the holy angels, and certainly his guardian angel watched over him in a very special manner, protecting him when in danger and guiding him through many a difficulty. Clement was a strong and healthy baby, and as he grew older he was very quick and clever, both at lessons and at games. Always the top of his class and carrying off the prizes, he was yet so gentle and amiable that he was loved by all, both old and young. Though later he became a very holy man and devoted his whole life to Almighty God, Clement did not become good all at once, and he had many a hard fight against temptation doing wrong just like little boys do nowadays, and little girls too. He himself tells us of two very naughty things he did when he was little, and they help to show us how hard he must have tried in order to become as good as he did, though after he had made his first Holy Communion we never hear of him being naughty on purpose. The first fault was committed when he was three or four years of age. One day he happened to pass a cart on which was placed, for sale, a large quantity of dates. Clement, after looking round and seeing that no one was near, filled his little blouse with the fruit, and then walked away eating the dates as fast as he could, when suddenly he met his father. "'Where did you get all those dates?' asked his father. Knowing that he had done wrong and afraid of being punished, Clement replied by telling a lie. "'Madame Tessany gave them to me,' he said. Madame Tessany was the owner of a little shop, where Clement's mother bought her vegetables, and she had from time to time given Clement an apple or a nut. But his father knew that she would not have given him so many dates, and taking him by the hand, he said, I see I have a thief for my son. Come with me, and we will go to Madame Tessany. The shame he felt when his father reproached and corrected him before Madame made Clement realize so well how wrong it was to steal, and then to excuse himself by telling a lie that never again was he known to touch anything that did not belong to him, and so sorry was he for this fault, that when he was older he never passed a day without giving up something at his meals to make up, as he said, for his greediness when he was a little child. The second fault, which he tells us about, happened about two years later, and might have ended very sadly if God had not protected his baby brother in a remarkable way. When Clement was six and a half, God sent his mother another little son, who was called Adrian. One day, leaving her baby boy asleep in his cradle at the top of the house, his mother went downstairs to prepare the dinner. Presently the child awoke and began to cry. "'Run upstairs, Clement, and rock the cradle,' said his mother. "'No,' replied Clement. "'I'm not a girl. Boys and men don't rock cradles.' His mother, unable to leave what she was doing just then, tried to coax him to go, 
but still he refused. Then she threatened to punish him if he did not obey. Very well, I will go, said the naughty boy, but I will rock so hard that the baby and cradle will tumble down. And up he went. The cradle was an old-fashioned one, mounted on high rockers, and a fall from that would probably cost the baby its life. After a little rocking, baby stopped crying, and soon fell asleep. But Clement, who was still in a very bad temper, then gave the cradle such a violent push that the baby was thrown out and the cradle overturned. The poor mother, hearing the noise, rushed upstairs, quite expecting to find her baby killed, for she had guessed by the sound what had happened. To her great joy she found the little boy quite uninjured, and so engrossed was she in soothing its cries that Clement was forgotten until the father returned, when he received the punishment he had so well merited. About this time Clement began to attend the catechism class with the other village children, but he was so clever that in a very short time he not only knew all the answers, but could give the explanations better than any of the bigger boys present. Clement now began to feel a great desire to be a better boy. He took more trouble to say his prayers well and to be obedient to his parents. At this time, too, he felt a great love and attraction to our Blessed Lady growing in his heart. I want to be her own little boy. I want to belong to her in a special manner, he would say to himself, and he would kneel at her altar, and looking up into the face of her statue, there would wonder what he could do to please her. About the time of his eighth birthday he went to the parish priest. Father, he said, I want to belong to Our Lady, to belong to her in a special way. What can I do? I am pleased to hear you say that, replied the priest, for if you will only give yourself to Our Blessed Lady, and try to please her, she will protect you through your whole life. Take this prayer. It is the one used by St. Aloysius Gonzaga. Go and kneel at Our Lady's altar, and read it slowly trying to mean every word you say. Clement took the prayer and did as the priest had told him. As I knelt there, he said, my soul was filled with joy. I felt that our dear lady had indeed accepted me, and from that day my life was changed. I wished only to live for her and her divine son. Three years after, the time fixed for his first Holy Communion drew near. Each day Clement knelt at our lady's altar and begged her to help him to prepare well for that great event. Day by day the first communicants went to the good priest's house for instructions. Clement had the special charge of his cousin, a boy of his own age, who had the misfortune to be blind. Each day Clement would go to his house to fetch him, and he looked after him so carefully and so kindly that everyone was touched. During the three days retreat that the children made, and even on the first communion day itself, Clement did everything for his blind cousin, but this did not prevent him from praying so fervently himself that many of the villagers noticed him. Ah, yes, said one man. They pray well now, but once their first communion is over, they forget all about it, and are no better than they were before. Clement heard this remark, and it made a great impression on him. They shall see, he said to himself, whether I am no better than before. And taking a piece of chalk, he wrote on the walls and on the door of his room, Clement belongs to God for ever. Never again was he the same reckless, heedless boy he had been, though he still remained eager at his studies and eager at his games. He was always happy, joyous, and light-hearted, offering up all he did, whether work or pleasure, for the greater glory of God. Later on he worked for God as a holy priest, and a Jesuit, at first in his own country, and afterwards at the foreign missions. End of section 8 Section 9 of First Communion Days by a Sister of Notre Dame. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Jane Jane and Mary were great friends, but though they lived next door to each other, they did not go to the same school. Jane went to a school just at the end of the street. Mary, who was a Catholic, had two roads to cross to get to hers, so that her mother always took her there and fetched her home again while Janey could go by herself. After school, Janey would wait to see if Mary and her mother were passing, and then if she saw them, she would run to meet them to ask if Mary could play with her after tea, and many a happy hour they spent together. One Saturday, Mary, in her turn, asked her mother if she might invite Janey to tea, 
and great was her delight when the permission was given. Early that afternoon Janie arrived, and Mary showed her all her treasures. There was her best doll, generally kept in mother's drawer, as well as two others, one of which she lent to Janie for the afternoon. Picture books, too, were brought out in a pretty blue rosary, which Janie thought was a necklace. After this they each took a doll in their arms and went into the little garden to play, until Mary's mother called them in to tea. To Jane's surprise, before they sat down, Mary and her mother made the shape of a cross on themselves, and Mary said some words aloud. Janie did not like to make any remark about it before Mary's mother, but after tea she asked Mary what she had said. "'I was asking God to bless my food,' said Mary. "'Catholics always do that.' "'But why did you draw a kind of cross on yourself?' said Janie. "'It was a cross,' Mary answered. "'Our Lord died on a cross, and that's his sign. "'Look, I'll teach you how to make it.' "'Then and there Mary taught her friend to make the sign of the cross. "'Janie was delighted, and very soon learnt both how to make the sign and to say the words. "'You should never be ashamed to make the sign of the cross,' said Mary. "'It's God's sign.' "'I never will.' replied Janie. The next morning, as Janie and her father and mother were about to sit down to breakfast, Janie remembered what she had learnt the evening before, and standing up made a big sign of the cross, saying the words aloud. "'What are you doing, Janie?' said her mother. "'I'm asking God to bless my food, mother. Mary and her mother always ask God to bless their food, and they make a cross on themselves because Christ died on the cross for them, and it is His sign.' Janie's father and mother looked at one another. They had no wish for their little girl to copy her Catholic friend, but as they had never taught her any grace themselves, they did not like to forbid her to ask a blessing on her food, so they said nothing more about it. After that day, Mary often told Janie about the instructions she had in school, and even taught her the prayers and assured him, until after a while there was very little that Mary knew, which Janie did not know too. The two friends liked these socks better than any of their other games. They called them playing school. Mary was the teacher, and Janie was the child. They were both very much in earnest. Janie never forgot now to say her prayers, either morning or evening, and sometimes when her mother was putting her to bed, she would tell her some of the wonderful things she had heard about Jesus and his blessed mother. Why don't you and Mary play proper games? Janie's mother would say. You two are far too young to be talking about religion. You should be playing with your dolls. We do sometimes, mother, said Janie, but they're only presents and religion is real. Don't you like to hear about God, mother? Yes, on Sundays sometimes, only I'm generally too busy to go to church. I've your father's dinner to get ready. Mary always goes to church on Sundays. If you're too busy to take me, mother, may I go with her? I should think Mary sees enough of you all the week. You always seem to be with her nowadays. But Mary was quite willing that Janie should come with her, and so the very next Sunday, instead of telling her to sit quiet and look at her picture books, Janie's mother dressed her in her best clothes, gave her a kiss, and told her she might go, just this once. Be sure to behave nicely, she said, or Mary will be sorry she is taking you. Janie was very quiet during Holy Mass, but she used her eyes and ears well. She knew that she must not talk in church, but she meant to ask Mary about everything she had seen and heard when they came out, and Mary was quite ready to answer all her questions. She told Janie about Jesus living in the tabernacle and how he was offered up to God during Holy Mass, just as he offered up himself on the cross. She also told Janie how he came into people's hearts in Holy Communion. He came into my heart this morning, she said, for I went to Holy Communion this morning with Mama and Daddy before breakfast. May I go to Holy Communion? said Janie eagerly. Oh, no, you can come to Mass with me, but you can't go to Holy Communion because you are not a Catholic. I wish I could be one, said Janie, but Mother doesn't want me to. When Janie returned home, dinner was ready, and during it Father and Mother had to hear all about Mass and Holy Communion and everything else that Janie had seen and heard. Then, after dinner, when everything was cleared away, and father and mother were resting in their easy chairs, she sang them the little hymn that Mary had taught her the week before. She had a pretty little voice, and sang it so nicely that her father was delighted. 
Don't you and Mary ever do anything but pray and sing hymns? He asked. Oh, yes, Father, we skip and run races, and then, when we are tired, I ask Mary to play school and tell me more about Jesus. It doesn't seem natural to me, said her mother. I never thought about things like that when I was a little girl. Oh, don't worry, Mother, said her father. They'll soon grow tired of it and think of some other amusement. About six weeks after this, Janie came home from school feeling very ill. Her head was burning and her throat was sore. Her mother put her to bed and went for the doctor, for many people in their street had the influenza, and she was afraid that Janie might be getting it too. The doctor came, and when he had seen Janie and felt her pulse and looked at her tongue, he told her mother that she certainly had a touch of influenza, but that he hoped it would be a mild attack, and that she would soon be well again. Janie was very good and patient. She took the medicine that the doctor sent without a murmur, though it was very bitter, and she did everything her mother told her. For four days she was very feverish. On the fifth day the fever left her, but it seemed to take with it all Janie's strength, leaving in place of a plump, rosy-cheeked girl, a pale-faced little invalid, too weak even to sit up in bed, unless mother's arm was round her. She had a little prayer book with holy pictures in it, which Mary had given her, and she liked her mother to read to her out of it. I wish Mary's priest would come and make me a Catholic, mother, she would say over and over again. At last her mother went to Mary's house and told her friends how Janie kept wishing to see a Catholic priest, and asked if they thought one would come to her little girl. Mary's mother was sure of it, and promised to bring one the next day. That evening, when the doctor came to see Janie, he found her very weak, and told her mother that he was afraid she would never run about again. She might live two or three days, or perhaps a week, but each day she was losing strength. The doctor was then told about her great desire to become a Catholic and to see a priest. "'Well, do not thwart her more than you can help,' he replied. "'Any happiness you can give her will do her good.' When the priest came the next day, Janie's mother saw him first and told him that she was quite willing to do anything that would make her little girl's last days happier. She talks of nothing but Mary's church and Mary's priest, said the poor mother, the tears streaming down her face. Tis the only religion she knows, so we are quite willing for her to be a Catholic, if it will make her happy. Then she took him up to Janie's little room, where he sat by the bed and talked to her gently and kindly. He was surprised to find how well the child was instructed, for there was very little Mary had learnt at school that she had not taught to Janie. Finding how really anxious she was to be a Catholic, so that she might receive our dear Lord in Holy Communion, the priest baptized her, heard her simple little confession, and promised to bring her Holy Communion the next morning. When he was gone, and Janie's father and mother were sitting with her, they could not help noticing the change in Janie's face. It was radiantly happy, and her eyes shone like two big stars. Oh, Mama, oh, Daddy, she said, I am so happy. I do love you for letting me be a Catholic. That evening, Mary's mother came in to show them how to prepare a little altar, and she brought with her a pretty little rosary that Mary had bought with her own pocket money for Janie. She also brought some roses to put on the altar, promising to come in time for Janie's first Holy Communion the next morning. About eight o'clock in the morning, the priest brought our Lord to Janie. Mary's mother was there, as she had promised, and Janie's father and mother knelt beside the bed. Janie, propped up with pillows, her eye closed, her hands clasped, looked like a little white lily as she received her dear Jesus into her heart. For some minutes she prayed fervently, then opening her eyes, she smiled sweetly at her father and mother, who were still kneeling near their little daughter, weeping silently. Oh, Daddy, do not cry, she said, for I am happy. The priest blessed her, promising to come and see her again that day, when he would give her still another sacrament called extreme unction. During the next two days, Janie grew weaker and weaker, but she was now perfectly happy. She knew she was dying, but for this was glad, she said, for then she would never stain her soul, which Jesus had washed so white in his own precious blood. The second day after her first Holy Communion, the little girl put her arms lovingly round her father and mother when they bent over her. Oh, I do love you so, she said as she kissed them, but I love Jesus best of all. That night she fell asleep, 
and whilst she was sleeping, Jesus came and took her little soul to his beautiful home in heaven. End of section 9「10 of First Communion Days by a Sister of Notre Dame. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Bobby. Bobby was just six when he first came to school, the chubbiest and happiest little lad you could wish to see. His father was an actor, and Bobby had traveled all over the country with him, going to school for a few weeks at a time in the town in which they were staying. But now that he was six, his father thought it best for his little son to remain at one school, where he would be properly taught, so he took some rooms in Liverpool for Bobby and his mother, and made arrangements for him to enter the convent school. Bobby was a friendly little fellow, and soon settled down quite happily. Although he was fonder of play than of work, he soon learnt to read and write, and also to say his prayers and catechism. Every Monday morning, Sister used to ask who had been to Mass the day before, and Bobby always had to answer, no. At first, as he was only six, Sister did not worry, but after his seventh birthday she began to get anxious. How is it you do not go to Mass? she inquired. Does not Mother take you with her? Mother doesn't go, he said. She always has a headache on Sundays. I give her her breakfast in bed, and then I go with Johnny Brown to sail my boat in the park. But the church is almost next door to your house. It will be quite easy to hear Mass before you go to play, said Sister. Bobby agreed it would, but the following Monday he still had to answer no to Sister's usual question. He was now in the first confession class, but Sister hesitated about letting him receive this sacrament because he still made no attempt to go to Mass on Sundays. Just before the day for the first confessions, Sister spoke to the priest about him, for you see, it was no good Bobby going to confession if he was not sorry, and he could not be sorry if he would not try to do his duty. However, the priest asked Sister to send him with the others, and he would have a talk with him. Bobby was quite pleased with the idea of going to confession, and told Sister he'd got plenty of sins ready, and that he expected he would feel quite different when they were all gone. Sister hoped for the best, and Bobby thought that once all his sins were gone, it would be easier to be good. So in his turn Bobby went to confession, and when he came out his little face looked very serious. He took no notice of the others, but walked quietly up to Our Lady's altar, and kneeling there prayed quietly for some time. The next Monday, when Sister asked who had been to Mass, up went Bobby's hand. Oh, Bobby, I am pleased, says Sister. I am always going now, said Bobby. I promised Our Lady that I would never, never miss again. That promise was kept. For the next three years Bobby remained at that school, he was always present at Holy Mass on Sunday. Not long after this Bobby made his first Holy Communion. All the little children's fathers and mothers were there, except for Bobby's. His mother had a headache and was in bed. So Bobby had dressed himself. However, no one was happier than he that day. He entered heart and soul into everything whether praying in the chapel or playing at the games provided for their amusement. Joy filled his soul, and a wonderful love for our divine Lord and his blessed mother, and Bobby had great need of all this love. For his mother, finding how faithful Bobby kept to his duties, how he never neglected his prayers, however late it was or tired he might be, did all she could to prevent him. On his first communion day Bobby had been given a little rosary, and each night he said it before getting into bed. Three or four times his mother, coming upstairs and finding him kneeling there, had pulled him roughly up and even beaten him, saying she wanted no religion in her house. But the next night would find Bobby again on his knees, for our blessed Lord strengthened him in a wonderful way. He had much difficulty, too, in getting to Mass, for once his mother discovered where he went on Sunday mornings, she did her best to prevent it. And though she sometimes prevented his going to Holy Communion, he never once missed Mass, for he had found out a church where he could hear one at twelve o'clock, when his mother thought it too late, and yet this little boy was only eight years old. In spite of her unkindness to him over his religion, Bobby loved his mother, and not one word of all she made him suffer was ever told at school, not even to the sister, who would never have known if the landlady where Bobby lived had not come up to see if anything could be done 
to make the little boy's life easier. Soon after this, Bobby was confirmed, and God, the Holy Ghost, by his great love of fortitude, helped him to persevere, and so he did until, soon after his tenth birthday, his father coming home and seeing how difficult things were for his little boy, took him away with him. End of section 10section 11 of first communion days by a sister of notre dame this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by maria therese Frankus. marie louise Frankus was born at the castle of Giesencourt, the home of her grandmother madame de focasoles the following day she was baptized and given the name of marie louise Frankus, as it was the feast day of saint francis her grandmother held her at the baptismal font and soon became so attached to the little one that she begged her mother to allow her to be brought up at the castle. As there were already two other children at home, her mother consented, and the little baby was taken to Giesencourt, which the grandmother promised should, later on, be given to Frankos for her own. Madame de Focasolas was a very good and fervent Catholic. Being so rich and living in such a beautiful home, she had many servants and tenants who lived on her estate. These she helped in every possible way. They looked up to her as their example, and went to her for advice in all their troubles and difficulties. Although her grandmother was so devoted to Frankos, she did not spoil her. On the contrary, she was very strict, and especially particular about obedience. Frankos had a very strong will of her own, and liked to have her own way, so that at times her grandmother was obliged to punish her. One morning, when the little grandchild disobeyed her governess, she was told to go as a punishment to the top of the stairs and remain on the landing till she was sent for. Frankos did not like this penance, so she said to her grandmother, If I go there, I shall scream so loud you will tell me to come down again. For she knew her grandmother could not bear much noise. You must go all the same, was the reply, and remain on the landing till you are given permission to come down. Very unwillingly, Frankos began to go up the stairs, saying as she went, I will not stop. I shall make too much noise. At last she arrived at the landing. Then opening her mouth, she began to scream at the top of her voice, until her grandmother, frightened that she would injure her chest, sent the governess to bring her down. Frankos was triumphant, and with a smiling face came down the stairs, holding the hand of her governess. I told you I should scream she said, feeling she had conquered. But her grandmother, calling her to her side, told her of the little child Jesus at Nazareth, how happy he made his dear mother by his obedience and gentleness, but that now he was in heaven, watching the little children whom he loved so dearly, and of how sad it once made him to see them naughty and disobedient. The little girl's eyes filled with tears. She had not thought of this. She would not make him sad again. No, she would go once more to the landing and stay there so quietly that he would be happy again. Then, without another word, she climbed the stairs a second time and remained for a full half hour upon the landing to make up, as she said afterwards, for displeasing little Jesus. For some time after this, Frankos tried to be good. Then she forgot all about little Jesus watching her, and there came another naughty day. There was a certain terrace in the grounds upon which Frankos had been told she must not walk. But just because it was forbidden, Frankos felt a great desire to go there. She went and was immediately sent for to be punished. The penance over, she went out again and again returned to the forbidden terrace, saying as she went, I want to go, so I shall go, just because I want to. Again she was sent for, and the penance repeated, but even this did not stop her. Six times she deliberately returned to the terrace. Six times was she brought back to her grandmother to be punished, and only after the last time did the willful child give in. Franco's very early understood the difference between really willful naughtiness and what was simply thoughtlessness. One day her grandmother had given her a pair of new shoes ornamented with large rosettes. While she was running near the lake, the rosettes became wet and dirty. Noticing this, her governess began to scold her for spoiling them. But Frankos replied, Why do you care so much about it? It isn't a sin to dirty rosettes. Another day, while they were out in the garden, 
Francos, who was only four years old, was stung by a wasp. She immediately began to scream aloud with the pain. Her governess told her she had much better be quiet and bear the pain for her sins. I haven't done any sins yet, the little girl replied, but I will stop crying for the love of Jesus. And she did. When Francos was six years old, she was prepared for her first confession. She told the priest all the sins that she could remember, but to her surprise he only gave her two Our Fathers for her penance. Fancy, she said to her governess, only two Our Fathers. Grandmother would have given me a much bigger penance. But the governess told her that our Lord had done penance for her when he had shed his precious blood during his bitter passion, and it was this precious blood that cleansed her soul in the sacrament of penance. Then let me go again, she said. Only what do people say the second time? Do they offend the good God again when he has once forgiven them? And from this time, Frankos was never known to be willfully disobedient, though, of course, she sometimes disobeyed through forgetfulness. As was said before, her grandmother did not spoil her, but the many visitors who came to stay at the beautiful castle were not so wise. They would tell the little girl how beautiful she was, praise her for her cleverness, and if her grandmother had not stopped them, would have ended in making her very vain and proud. But seeing the danger of leaving Frankos to their spoiling, she arranged to send her to a convent school all the summer months. Then, when winter came and all the visitors had gone, she would have her home again to live with her. It was during one of these summer terms, at the convent school, that Frankos made her first Holy Communion. Very carefully did the good sisters prepare her for this great sacrament. They taught her how to pray well and how to fight against her faults so that every day they might become fewer. Then for three days before her first Holy Communion, Frankos went into retreat. That is, instead of doing lessons and playing with the other children, she spent those days in preparing her heart to receive our blessed Lord, listening to the instructions given, reading the life of Jesus or of his saints, and also by praying before the blessed sacrament in the convent chapel. She also tried to make her heart very pure by making a fervent confession full of sorrow for the many times she had saddened little Jesus by her willfulness and disobedience. She asked her grandmother and governess also to forgive her for the trouble she had given them. When the happy day came, with a heart overflowing with joy, she offered herself body and soul to our blessed Lord. He accepted her offering, and later on, when she was grown up, he asked her to give up all her riches and pleasures, and to come to live with him and work for him, teaching little children to know and love him. Francos did as he asked. She sold all her great possessions, and with the money helped to build convent schools where hundreds of children, who would otherwise never have known about Almighty God, were taught by her and by others who came to live with her. In the section 11. Section 12 of First Communion Days by Sister of Notre Dame. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese A First Communion Day It was a week before the First Communion Day, when five little children might have been seen seated together, engaged in earnest conversation. The eldest, Nita, a dark-haired, dark-eyed girl of eight, was in the middle of the group. My heart is full of beautiful flowers for baby Jesus, she was saying, but oh, if only I could do some great big thing for him before next week. I should like to do a great big thing, too, said a little fair-haired girl of six and a half, named Josie. I did lend my best dolly to Annie yesterday, though I wanted it myself, and I didn't cry when I fell down in the garden and hurt my knee. Those were rather big things. Yes, they were all right, but not really big, like the things I mean, answered Nita. But sister said everything we did for Jesus counted, broke in Nora and I've done lots and lots of little things to please him. When baby Jesus comes to my heart, he will find it full of little daisy flowers. I've done things like not talking in class and trying with my writing, said little Claire, but I don't always remember, and I haven't done any big ones. I wonder if little Jesus is looking forward to next week. Perhaps he's looking down on us now and seeing which heart he likes best, said Nita. He always likes to watch us when we are good. Mother says that when we play nicely together, he comes and plays with us, though we can't see him. Does he? said Josie, much impressed. 
Then let's go and play now, and perhaps he will come too. But at that moment the bell rang, and jumping up the little group ran to join the others. A few more days went by. Then came the beautiful Feast of the Annunciation, the 25th March. The Mass was to be at eight o'clock. In good time the chapel was filled to overflowing. In the very front row knelt the little first communicants in snow-white dresses, wreaths, and veils. Behind them knelt their parents, the rest of the chapel being filled with sisters and pupils. The altar was beautifully decorated with sweet spring flowers, and during the Mass the organ played, and the people sang in honor of the occasion. After the consecration, the little ones said aloud their simple acts before Holy Communion, after which they slowly and reverently approached the altar rails. Returning to their places with their little hands joined and their heads bent low, they knelt so quietly that not one was seen to move. When Mass was over, the priest returned to the sacristy. Still the little ones remained wrapped in prayer. The short acts after Holy Communion were commenced by one of the sisters. Obediently each little head was raised, and reverently the prayers were repeated. Then once more the first communicants prayed in silence, until a signal was given that it was time to leave the chapel. Down in the big hall the parents were now waiting to see their little ones. At first the children seemed quite shy, but soon they were eagerly showing their first communion presents, medals, prayer books, or rosaries, with numbers of holy pictures. Then came breakfast, and during the morning a visit with the sister superior to each of the classes of the school. Seeing the happy little faces brought back to the minds of the big girls happy memories of their own first communion day, now long past. Then there were merry games and happy hours together, with now and again a little visit to chapel, just to thank our dear Lord once more for their great privilege, and to show him that he was not forgotten. The day ended with benediction during which the little ones read aloud an act of consecration to Our Lady, asking her to help them always to keep their hearts pure and white for little Jesus. Soon after this, the children's parents had to return home. When the last goodbyes had been said, the five little girls eagerly gathered round Sister, anxious once more for her to admire their presence and to talk over events of the day. Sister, said Nita, Josie told us she couldn't think of anything to say when she came back from the altar this morning. Little Josie's face flushed with shame, but looking up shyly at Sister, she said, I did talk to Jesus after the prayers, but at first I could only keep hugging him tight and saying, Dear little Jesus, I do love you, over and over again. But after the prayers, I said Hail Marys for everybody. That was a beautiful Thanksgiving, Josie says sister. Little Jesus likes so much to hear you tell him that you love him. I told him I loved him, sister, said Nora, and I told him the story of St. Gerard, and said I would come and talk to him when he was lonely, too, like St. Gerard did. I told Jesus about Blessed Julie, and I told him my brother teased me, and I told him all about the flowers I had put in my heart for him, said Nita. Oh, I forgot all about the flowers, broke in Claire. But he would have seen them, wouldn't he, sister? I told Jesus about Mother being ill and asked him to make her better, said Agnes, who had been very disappointed that her parents had been unable to be present that day, and I asked him to help me with my reading and sums. Little Jesus has answered part of your prayers already, said sister, for a letter came this evening to say that Mother was better and that Daddy hoped she would be soon quite well again and able to come and see her little girl. Oh, sister, isn't he good? replied Agnes. May we go to Holy Communion again tomorrow, so that I may thank him? Now that you have made your first Holy Communion, you may all go every day, just like the other girls. Only you will talk to him and not leave him alone when he comes, won't you? answered sister. Oh, yes, indeed we will, they all exclaimed. Every night when I go to bed, I shall try to think of something nice to tell little Jesus said Josie. I want him to like coming into my heart best of all. So shall I, chimed in each of the others. Just then the bell rang for supper, after which five tired but very happy little children were soon fast asleep in bed. End of section 12. End of First Communion Days by Sister of Notre Dame.